Tonight on Talking Politics, it's been one year since Michelle Wu was sworn in as mayor of Boston, the first woman and person of color ever elected to that job. And what a year it has been. We'll dig into all of the controversies and successes she's dealt with so far and what's likely to come in the next 365 days ahead. But first, a look at another local politician with some major national ambitions. Congresswoman Catherine Clark is vying for a promotion after Republicans officially clinched control of the House earlier this week. And Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced she won't run for another term in House leadership. As assistant speaker since 2020, Clark is already the fourth-ranking Democrat in the House, but now she's announced she's running for the number two spot, House Minority Whip. And Clark isn't the only Massachusetts politician getting national attention this week. After years as an outsider in the state Republican Party, outgoing Governor Charlie Baker went on CNN with Jake Tapper a few days ago to share his vision for the future of the GOP nationwide. One of the messages from the election is... Uh, for Republicans generally is um, we, need, we need as a party to move past uh, President Trump and to move on to an agenda that represents the voices of um, all those in the party and the people of the country. I'm joined now by GBH News State House reporter Katie Lannon and Mike Dean, co-author of the Daily Newsletter from Axios Boston. Good to see you both, Katie, Mike. Uh, Mike, when I first heard that Nancy Pelosi was going to be exiting, I wondered if Catherine Clark might be in the mix to become the, the new top-ranking Dem in the House. What is the role that she is actually going to be seeking entail? Well, the minority whip is the number two slot uh, as far as Democrats uh, as they kind of go into the minority uh, in this new Congress. And it seems like it's been in the works for a while. Hakeem Jeffries has definitely had support to become the Speaker of the House. The New York that's, Congressman, yeah. Right, that, that's going to be the, the major play to be the new top leader. And um, he'll be the first uh, person of color and first black man to be the Speaker of, I mean, to be the uh, minority leader and run a party like that. Um, and Clark will really be his top lieutenant if she secures is this whip position. Uh, on paper, the whip uh, is, you know, just whips the votes, so to speak. Make sure that all the Democrats are towing the party line, are doing what the minority leader, in this case probably Jeffries, wants them to do, votes how they want them to be, make sure that they're all there, corrals them. Um, but she will be a very, very uh, top advisor to the minority leader, and maybe more importantly, even the assumed successor uh, to Jeffries if he were to ever leave that position, uh, either as the minority leader or in the, as the speaker at some point in the future if Democrats win back the House. Tell me if I'm right here to use an analogy that, that will only be of interest or make sense to some of our viewers. What you describe sounds to me almost like the, the distinction between the editor and the managing editor at, say, a daily newspaper, the person who's more focused on logistics, making the trains run on time, that sort of stuff. Is that fair? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And, and it helps you build those relationships where she may very well become speaker someday if that slot were to open up. Katie Lannon, is Clark's new role, do you think, likely to make a difference in terms of what we here in Massachusetts get, to put it bluntly, from uh, the federal government in the years to come? Or is it maybe not going to have that effect, especially given the composition of Congress right now and the fact that we're going to be dealing with divided government? Yeah, I think what you really need to look at here is that Massachusetts does have an all-Democrat delegation, and as the, the House minority party, we do have this kind of boost in profile under Catherine Clark's rise, but we're also losing a significant degree of clout in terms of the, the yeah. powerful committee chairmanships that folks like Richie Neal and Jim McGovern have held. So it'll be a, a loss in that way and what the delegation is simply able to bring home. But, you know, if you're playing the long game here, and I think we've pretty much seen Catherine Clark is as she's been quietly rising through the ranks. You know, Nancy Pelosi was in Congress for 20 years before she became speaker. Catherine Clark was on the Melrose School Committee 15 years ago. So if she keeps up this trajectory, you know, in the long run, that could be very meaningful for Massachusetts in terms of what she's able to secure for the state. I'm so glad you mentioned where she was was 15 years ago, and that's really a, a mind-boggling ascent. Uh, Mike, Dean, what do you make of Governor Baker's decision to participate in that nationally televised interview that we just showed a little tiny bit of on mm -hmm. CNN, I believe the very day before 
President Trump announced that he was going to make a third run for the White House? It means that Baker is still dedicated to the Republican Party. He still has uh, some hope that, that that party can survive and moderate itself um, and, you know, have politics that Charlie Baker would approve of. Um, he's definitely been much more vocal in the last few weeks about his brand of centrism, about his brand of republicanism, that New England brand, um, than he has been you know, before he was a lame duck, so to speak. Uh, so I think that interview it came as somewhat of a surprise that all of a sudden there was this Jake Tapper interview in the corner office, big deal, national coverage, Baker as a spokesman for a wing of the National Republican Party in a way. Um, but it didn't really surprise too many people around Beacon hmm. Hill that Baker feels that way. Right, right. I should probably mention, I think this interview was uh, arranged or was broadcast at least right around the time that the National or the Republican Governors Association had gotten together. So that gives it a little, to my mind, a little extra punch. Katie Lannon, is this the sort of thing that you do if you are planning to just quietly retire from your role as governor and keep a low profile in the coming years or not? I mean, I think that's kind of an obvious question yeah, right now. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah okay. There, you, it's not a low pro <laughs> profile at all. And these yeah. are things that, you know, we, those of us who cover the State House, who have been asking Charlie Baker about Trump, about the Republican Party, and things like that for years, didn't really hear much new, but it is new for him to be taking on this kind of national stage. He's a guy who, for years, when asked those questions, falls back on, I'm focused on my day job. Yeah. That's what the people of Massachusetts mm -hmm. elected me for. But now his day job is winding down, and it certainly does seem as though he's looking for some sort of presence on the national stage as he plans ahead. But, you you know, he said he doesn't want to run for a higher office at this point, which, of course, is always something people say until they're running for higher office. Very true. But he's been consistent on that. But that doesn't mean he'll fade off into the sunset. Mm -hmm. Right. I think we're going to we've seen him take on some national speaking engagements. And, you know, I think anything could could happen for him from here. I know. I think I've talked about it in this space before with both of you. Maybe not simultaneously, but I just think it's going to be one of the most fascinating subplots in Massachusetts politics to, to watch. Let's take a look, actually, before we leave Governor Baker, just a little snippet of one other comment he had to make to Jake Tapper about the role of moderation in politics. Voters, generally speaking, especially in battleground states, um, aren't interested in extremism. They just aren't. They want people who they believe are going to be reasonable, who are going to be collaborative, and who represent sort of the fundamental tenet of democracy. I think in the midterms, one of the big lessons that the Republican Party nationally needs to take away from it is, uh, is voters want collaborative elected officials. They don't want extremes. So Katie, there's Governor Baker talking in the abstract about what voters want uh, based on his own experience in Massachusetts. He ruffled some feathers in this past week when he vetoed, I believe, a million dollars mm -hmm. that was allocated for an ad campaign that was supposed to warn people away from, quote unquote, crisis pregnancy centers. Why did the governor veto that allocation? And um, does his explanation of why he vetoed it, does it square with, with what maybe his critics are saying? Yeah, his explanation of why he vetoed it was the kind of thing you typically see whenever he vetoes something. It was, he said he was slashing the money because it duplicates something the government is already doing with inf making this information available, which is the kind of thing he does usually say. And whether it is a straight, responsible stewardship of taxpayer dollars motivation or whether he's using that to go over, you know, give him some cover for something else, you don't really know. But that is, he does kind of tread this middle ground on abortion in a way yeah. where he describes himself as pro-choice, he supports the right to abortion, but he's maybe not as committed or as far uh, on that as some of the reproductive health advocates might like him to be. Mike, do you have the same take uh, uh, on Baker's veto as Katie does? Yeah, I think uh, if you kind of read between the lines of that veto, you could read into it a little bit of maybe um, greater sympathy for 
uh, maybe someone who is anti-abortion, who is seeking legitimate care, um, instead of railing against these types of uh, centers the way that most Democrats have been. We haven't seen Baker uh, been nearly as vocal against these types of places the way that the attorney general and governor-elect have been. Um, so maybe it's one of those things where Baker just reminds you that he is a Republican. He is pro-choice, but uh, it's a kind of a very narrow pro-choice in a lot of different ways um, when Baker approaches these things. Let's not forget that he did veto the Roe Act at first uh, when that was passed a few years ago. And we should probably mention just a little bit of context, which some of our viewers will already know, but critics of crisis pregnancy centers say that they are intentionally misleading, that they masquerade as places where someone, for example, might be able to get an abortion and then try to talk people out of getting it. I believe that Baker uh, issued this veto after Crisis Pregnancy Center supporters said, hey, we're, we're beleaguered, we are being threatened inappropriately. It's not responsible to ramp up the threat that we're facing at this moment in time. So that's a little bit of background there. Uh, I wanna ask you both about the Boston Globe's report uh, a couple days ago that Maura Healy, who was identified as living in the city of Boston, Throughout the gubernatorial campaign, I'm pretty sure by us here at GBH News and by everyone else, uh, that she's actually currently living in Cambridge, which isn't too far away from Boston, but is a different place. Uh, Mike, the reaction that I've seen online to this has, has sort of been split. It's people on the one hand saying, you know, I live in Worcester, what's the big deal? Like, you know, she might as well live in Boston if she lives in Cambridge. And then other people saying, oh, sure, now you tell us. Now you let us know that Maura Healy's been misrepresenting herself on this very fundamental point, and now she's governor-elect. Uh, do you see this as a noteworthy development or a noteworthy story? It certainly seems like um, a, a play out of the Maura Healy playbook. Uh, that we didn't know about this, that certainly the press weren't informed. There's some question over whether or not the campaign finance officials should have been informed yeah. sooner about this. Um, so that is something that needs to be resolved as well. Uh, but she ran a very under the radar type of campaign for someone who was so popular and won by so much. Um, very few uh, particular answers to questions from the press, uh, very few uh, e elaborated platform positions or plans for certain things. It is, Katie can tell you, it's incredibly difficult to nail Mar Healy down on a what are you going to do or what have you done kind of a question. Um, it's uh, just a lot of pivoting towards talking points so it, it did not surprise me that the campaign withheld this information, essentially, that uh, the governor-elect had moved uh, across the river, so to speak. Um, and it just kind of shows that they are not forthcoming with an awful lot of this type of information. Katie, you think this story is going to sort of fade away, or is, or is this going to have ramifications that unfold in the coming weeks? I think it depends on how the, the campaign, the transition team, the incoming administration handles it. If, you know, they've said that they'll keep posted with more information on where she does ultimately end up living if this was kind of a temporary situation. Yeah, yeah glad you mentioned um, that. And so we'll, we'll see, right? I think because it has been such a muted campaign, uh, we are looking for kind of the tea leaves that we can read about what kind of administration she'll run and ultimately we'll, we'll find out in January. But I do think there's other in interesting elements here as well in that, you know, we'll have a governor who's a renter and how will that inform her, her housing policy that she's, she's put out a plan? Will she, you know, you don't live in Porter Square because it's a drivable neighborhood. Will she take the tea? There'll be a mm -hmm. lot of... Uh, different lifestyle elements possible with uh, a kind of urban renting, maybe transit riding governor. That's fascinating. Katie Lannon, Mike Dean, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, a year and two days ago, Boston witnessed this history-making moment. Thank you, Boston. I am so honored to stand here in this chamber that has meant so much to me as your next mayor. In the 365 days that followed, Mayor Wu, the first woman and the first person of color ever elected to the job, has faced controversies over the cleanup at Mass and Cass, butted heads with the Baker administration, and fended off a near-state takeover of the Boston public schools. She's also taken steps toward greater racial equity in Boston, appointed a police commissioner who was previously beaten by members of the department he now leads, and taken action to fight climate change. GBH News City Hall reporter Soraya Winters Smith spoke with the mayor this week to get her reflections on year one. She joins me now, along with GBH politics editor 
Peter Kansas, good to see you both. Hey, hey Adam. Soraya, the piece you wrote, which is a fascinating article, very detailed, everyone watching should read it, chronicles the ups and downs of Wu's first year. Where can she look back and claim meaningful victories? I think there are a number of small victories that she has that sort of go towards chipping away at her massive campaign goals. When you look at installing Arthur Jemison, the chief of planning, that's a whole new role. She also cleared out the expired term members of the ZBA. When you look at equity, she awarded the city's largest uh, non-construction contract to a certified black-owned business at $17 million. Is that for the Boston Public Schools that meals, is to, correct? Yep, to yep, to give food service to Boston Public Schools. Uh, I will just also say averting the state takeover of the public education system is a small victory for the mayor also. Yeah. Uh, uh, how about when it comes to politics, also when it comes to uh, policy, where did things not go quite as planned for the mayor? Sure. Uh, one thing that I think sort of seized the public consciousness but then went away is um, her one of her first actions to install a very strict vaccine mandate for the city's workforce. That went through court, state court, and then an appeal, and now it is awaiting another one of its days in court. Uh, the state Supreme Judicial Court will have a hearing about it early next year. The other thing, I think Mass and Cass the jury's still out on that because of competing narratives. On one hand, you have the administration saying, look, we've moved the people who were out there last year into permanent supportive housing that we've set up. So they say it's a work in progress that's working, but anybody who drives around there or lives around there will see we're still struggling with the same sorts of problems that we were a year ago with different people, but it's still a problem. Yeah, that's a tough one. If you, if you head through the neighborhood and you see something that looks almost identical, to what you saw a year ago or three years ago, even if some people have been housed, um, still a lot of human misery right. on display there. Peter Kadzis, you've covered, I believe, every Boston mayor since Kevin White. Am I correct about that? Correct. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, given that, given that deep and rich experience, what's your sense of how Wu's year one stacks up against her predecessors? Well, for, first of all, um, I jumped in with Kevin White in the middle of his term. Okay. But every mayor has their own beginning. But it's like getting a new car. You know, you're learning how to use the different pedals, the different levers. Mayor's first years are, are relatively unremarkable. Um, one big difference is that after Mayor Tom Menino, um, Tom and Edo got the city's finances in good shape. So um, Marty Walsh and uh, Mayor Wu don't have to worry about money, at least not now. Maybe in a few years they might have to. But that's, that gives you a lot of breathing room. Yeah, that's interesting because I started covering local politics with you back at the Boston Phoenix, I think, around 20 years ago. <laughs> and in all that time, I can never recall a moment where Boston's finances seemed from the outside to be in dire shape. It just hasn't been part of the, part of the narrative. You've also covered Michelle Wu since the very beginning of her political career. Given what you know about her personality and what you know about her political inclinations. Was there anything about her first year that surprised you or didn't proceed the way you would have expected it to? Well, yes, and it's, it's um, not so much her, it was the reaction to what Soraya was talking about, the, um, the, the COVID mandates. Um, it, it was vicious, it was racist, it was all out of proportion. I was astounded. I think most of the city was astounded because Michelle Wu is a. It's not that she's mild mannered. She's a very um, uh, driven woman, but she is not one that I thought would prompt such an over the top appeal. But in a way, Adam, let me go back to the question you asked before about the first year of. Of, of mayoralty. Um, 
Michelle Wu has more in common with Ray Flynn's first year than people might think. And that's because when Ray Flynn became mayor, Boston was still recovering from the uh, intense racial animosity from uh, Boston school desegregation. Um, Mayor Wu took over while the city was still recovering, as was the nation, from the George Floyd mm -hmm. um, murder. And as a result of both those times, Ray Flynn having beat Mel King, the, the first black politician to make a citywide run for mayor, and Michelle Wu facing a, a multi-ethnic um, field of opponents, um, you know, there's a common thread there. And that, that common thread is that black power uh, for Ray Flynn and black power for um, Mayor Wu were really consistent issues that she had to deal hmm. with. Hmm. Soraya, I want to actually just take a, a little detour and ask you about what Peter mentioned, the, the backlash to her COVID mandates. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of people have sort of lost track of this fight it's, as it's worked its way through the, the courts. And obviously right now, knock on wood, we're in a better spot in terms of the pandemic than we were a year ago. But I've been struck at the fact that, and and I'm not out on the stump, or not out following her, unlike you, on a daily basis or regular basis. But I've been struck at how regular the people who are vehemently opposed to her COVID mandates, how regular a presence they've been. You wrote about them being uh, camped out outside her house most mornings. They also seem to pop up at a lot of public events that she does in the neighborhoods. Is that something that you think is likely to continue in year two, or is it already fading away? I genuinely don't know. I think when we see the court fight come back, There'll be sort of a resurgence of the issue in people's minds. I think also the administration would tell you that they've set up a number of protections or buffers so that if it does continue, then they're trying to make sure that they draw a line between harassment and folks' free speech. I think the fact that the city council scaled back some of the protest hours in light of the harassment that mm -hmm. Michelle was, was experiencing means that everybody in the city is sort of planning for the worst, but hoping for the best. Uh, that's just something, you know, talking about 20 years of watching this. Again, I cannot remember seeing a politician dog continually by protests like that. Governor Baker, I know, had to deal with stuff at his house, and that could get pretty ugly, but it wasn't as routine a thing as this has been. Peter, in Soraya's piece, which you edited, as many of our viewers <laughs> will know, uh, Soraya made the point that the relationship that Michelle Wu has with Maura Healy, the governor-elect, is going to be really important when it comes to her ability to realize her hopes for the city. What's your sense of what that relationship is at present and where it might go in the future? Well, I believe that most political relationships are transactional. I, I mean, it has to do with what's on the table. You know, who's helped, who's hurt. Mara Healy will ask herself, am I helped or hurt by this particular thing that Mayor Wu wants me to do? Now, the governor is important because many of the things um, especially rent control that Mayor Wu would like to enact are going to require a home rule petition, which the governor ultimately has to sign off on. That's why the relationship is so important. I would also add that her relationship with Ron Mariano, the Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. um, is an important one. Because before the home rule petition to put rent control through reaches the governor, has to go through the legislature. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's any lingering feelings, let's, let's keep it fuzzy, about um, Wu's endorsement of uh, Shannon Liz 
ridden as as opposed to Andrea Campbell. I mean, Democratic uh, primary for attorney general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's got to be bad blood there. I mean, now if people are capable of moving on, I mean, God knows over the years we've had arguments about stuff and sure. come back to work the next day <laughs> and everything's hunky dory. But there's got to be some lingering um, animosity mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. On the surface, everything's fine. They're pros. It'll be fine. But I, I suspect, and I can only, I have to emphasize suspect, I, I suspect there's a little tension there. Soraya, as you look ahead to Wu's second year, what are some of the big things that you're going to be watching in the coming months, or watching for? I think Peter just mentioned rent control, which the mayor said she plans to debut a policy on either before the year is out or early next year. But Adam, I think bigger than any one policy discussion that we'll see as we move into the second year and beyond of the Wu administration, I think she's going to be on the hook for more things than she was before. Yeah. Now that she's set the foundation and built out a team we see already she has a police commissioner, we see an uptick in crime, and people are asking, what's your plan for that? She has a school superintendent. She made that memorandum of understanding with the state to avert the takeover. Mm -hmm. uh, now people are going to ask if test scores don't go up or there's still achievement gaps, people will ask what her plans are for the school. So maybe, I was thinking about this, maybe this is where being a protege of Warren will help because... Maybe she'll have something to say when people say, where's your plan for that? To paraphrase, <laughs> just what, you know, along the lines of what you were saying, I think of Ron Mariano, Ron Mariano, when he became House Speaker and was asked what his plans were on one topic or another, and he said, hey, what are you talking about? I just got here. She can no longer say she exactly. just got here, heading, exactly. in, heading into year two. Peter, how about you? What are the big things you're going to be watching for? Um, I wonder, uh, Soraya alluded to this, I wonder how long the mayor can dodge getting, making comment about the, let's face it, fairly rotten state of the Boston public schools. Now, she's addressing the physical plant, um, and that's important and that's needed, but um, the underperforming, the, you know, the, uh, the academic, the poor academic performance, um, she's been able to dance away from it, but I, I wonder how much longer that can happen. It's going to be interesting also because she has attracted a fair amount of national attention. I can't remember the number of New York Times pieces I've read about her, but it's more than one. So she's managed to become a figure who transcends local politics, so we won't be the only ones watching. <laughs> Peter Kadzis, Soraya Wintersmith, thank you for talking this through. That's it for tonight, but do come back next week and please tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics, or you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Riley Adam. For now, thank you for watching and good night. Tonight on Greater Boston, we go in-depth on important stories, we talk to the people behind those stories, and we bring you expert insight and a wide array of views on issues which you care about and which you should. Greater Boston, Monday through Thursday at 7. It's critically important to remember